Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. James Lyons Weiler coming to you live from the WWDNYK studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is our second podcast today, and uh, our first podcast on PCR testing in COVID 19 went very well this morning. I think we learned a lot. Um, this afternoon, um, we have a very special guest who's coming to us from uh, Hawaii, uh, Michel Carbon uh, of the uh, University of Hawaii. He's the William and Ellen. Mellon Chair in Cancer Biology, Professor of Pathology, Director of Thoracic Oncology at University of Hawaii Cancer Center in Honolulu. He is board certified in anatomic pathology, both in Italy and the United States, and he has a PhD in human pathology with a thesis on tumor viruses. His current research funding includes grants from the NIH, the NCI, U.S. Department of Defense, and unrestricted donations from the University of Hawaii Foundation. Carbone studies gene environment interaction fascinating stuff through field studies in remote villages in Turkey and molecular studies in his laboratory in Honolulu. He discovered that hetero heterozygous germline BAP1 mutations cause a novel cancer syndrome that he named the BAP1 cancer syndrome with 100% penetrance. That means that everyone who has the, uh, that particular variant develops um, cancer and that gene environment interaction modulates the incidence of mesothelioma, eye melanoma, and other human cancers. Carbone has worked for three years in the viral pathogenesis section at the NIAID and for five years in the viruses and cellular biology section at the NICHD in Bethesda, where he studied DNA tumor viruses. Subsequently, he has held multiple NIH R01s to study DNA tumor viruses. He has recently published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology about COVID-19. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks for being here on Car on uh, on Breaking Science. Thank you. Right. So, how are things in Hawaii with coronavirus? I'm sure people in the rest of other states are interested. How are things there? In Hawaii, we do not have a problem, um, or at least is the state in the United States, maybe the place in the world where the problem is less serious than anywhere else. We have very few people infected and very few people died of it uh, compared to any other part of the world. And the reason are various, but the main reason is that we are lucky to live in a place where you live outside 365 days a year. And so when you live outside, when you do not congregate into enclosed spaces, which is where the virus uh, pass around, then an epidemic is extremely unlikely to happen. What do you think about the role of uh, vitamin D from sunshine in helping to reduce uh, the viremia in people, letting their immune systems fold proteins yes, properly? I heard about that, and uh, I do not have an opinion about that because I do not know enough to comment about that. Hmm. But what is certain is that if you are outside, the risk of transmission is extremely low, if any. And that's the main reason that in Hawaii we are fine. And in places where it's too cold or too hot to stay outside, you are seeing the terrible epidemic, the rate of infections that you are seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know that there have been some observations on, um, you know, the certainly the the rate of mortality seems to be decreasing seasonally if the rate of infections are not the infection case fatality rate seems to be dropping with uh, sunshine uh, longer days in the northern hemisphere um how uh how is uh, coronavirus what, what what was your publication on the journal of thoracic ecology about on COVID 19 what did you discuss um this was the first report about the uh, findings in the lungs of people who died of coronavirus. That was uh, written by Dr. Shao. Dr. Shao is a professor of pathology at the University of Chicago, and he's also the chair of pathology at, at the Wuhan University. So he spent six months in Chicago and six months in Wuhan. And so he was there when this thing started and uh, it was forbidden uh, to do autopsies on people with COVID because they were afraid of the consequences of it. Uh, therefore, um, he had the idea to test the lungs of people who had been operated of lung cancer during that period, thinking that most likely they were also infected by COVID and that was the case. And so he described what happens in the lungs of 
people who are infected with COVID and why they die of COVID. Okay, so I understand that we what we have is a um, situation where unlike other respiratory viruses, including SARS, there seems to be damage to the lung and epithelial all the way out to the periphery. Uh, could you tell us what, what glassy opacities are? What are those, what does it mean when the pathologist sees that on a radiologic exam? It means that there is fibrin depositions into the lungs and you have this fibrin plugs together with the growth of, of uh, muscle cells and therefore there is no more surface in the lung that can breathe and because the uh, alveoli are covered by these fibrinous plugs and by the proliferation of the, the underlying fibroblast even if you give oxygen to the patients you cannot save them because there is, the lung can, cannot breathe right and so uh, are there other conditions that have similar kinds of um, uh, patho pa pathology uh, tissue? In the well, tissue? you can have a situation in which you have, for example, diffuse alveolar damage that is caused by toxic fumes or things like that, in which you have extensive uh, damage of the alveolar surfaces and so they cannot breathe. Yeah. So in your editorial, you, uh, um, uh, this, this is uh, now in April or so, um, you predicted that uh, society would come to understand that um, the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection was going to be much higher uh, than the incidence of COVID-19 diagnosis that we were seeing. Is that right? Well, initially we were testing. Yeah, the answer is yes. Initially we were testing only people who presented at the hospital. Um, of course, for every person that presented in the hospital, there were another 10 who were not sick enough to go to the hospital. So if you only test the people that come to the hospital, you underestimate the incidence of the infection because fortunately, the majority of people who are infected never get so sick to go to the hospital. In fact, now we have learned that many people don't get sick at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only a fraction that has been estimated about 20% of those who get sick who require medical care assistance and who can check into the hospital. So for initially, we only tested those who came to the hospital. That caused two things. First, we underestimated the extent of people who were infected. And secondly, we overestimated the danger of the disease because of course, those who went to the hospital were people who were the sicker ones. And so we thought that this the infection would cause this damage to everybody who was infected. And then we learned that fortunately that is not the case. Okay, so people need to understand the difference between um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, right? Um, well, let's do it. Let's back up a little. They need to understand the difference in terms of diagnostic pathology, uh, in terms of a PCR test detecting the presence of the virus in, say, the nasopharyngeal tract and infection, a viable infection, and even uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they don't, and the difference between a SARS-CoV-2 infection and a COVID-19 diagnosis, right? So uh, when we're thinking about it in terms of epidemiology, sometimes those distinctions are very blurred, uh, especially if you're doing symptom-based diagnosis first, and then you transition to population-wide screening uh there seems to i'm working on a problem right now michelle maybe you can help me a little bit with your thoughts on this in that there seems to me that there would be a switch point in an outbreak of a of a disease a pathogen it by which as the pathogen increases in the total number of people that it's infected that the uh, symptom only testing strategy is more ethical than a screen and then there would be a switch point to where population-wide screen becomes more ethical than symptom-based testing. It is, is that something you understand? I think so. I think that, uh, as you noted, there is a tremendous confusion. Um, one of the confusion around, I think, is caused by terminology. When I went to medical school, we called cases people who were sick. And if you look at most diseases that I know of, cases are people who are sick instead now we call cases 
people who are sick and people who are infected. We mix them together. When you mix them together, it's very difficult to understand the difference. There is a world of difference being sick and being just a carrier of a virus, but you are not sick. But we mix all of them together. And that uh, is uh, cause panic. Because if you talk about uh, uh, thousands and thousands of new cases, that cause panic. If you were to present things in a more objective way, and that is, there are so many people who have been tested, who are infected, and of those, so many got sick. That uh, represents more reality. The other part of it is to represent the disease as it is, and that means a very serious disease for certain group of people, so which are older people, which are people who have uh, uh, pre-existing serious conditions, for we and for them this disease is very dangerous and they are those who need to be protected but there is all another group of people that fortunately is not affected except in very rare cases by this disease that may carry the virus and so they may infect other people but for themselves the risk is relatively minor and then there is another group of patients that is the kids under 10 year old that do not seem to spread the disease. And so for those, the risk of getting sick is extremely low. And uh, the, the risk of people who enter in contact with them is apparently non-existing based on what we see in the Scandinavian and in other northern countries that have reopened the school and found that there is no infection coming from these kids. So the disease needs to be presented in uh, reality because if you scare people unnecessarily, people react the opposite way because somewhere they feel that this makes no sense. If you underestimate the disease, that also is not good because there are people who are at very high risk of dying if they are infected. For example, people who have leukemia, who have hematologic disorders, who are treated with immunosuppressive drugs, they are at very high risk of dying if they are infected with COVID-19. And so, or people who are over 80 years old. So these are the people that need to be protected. At the same time, there is no need to scare those who have a very, very low risk. Now I know that every once in a while, somebody comes and says, oh, you see, a kid died. Yes, a kid died. And that it's inevitable that there are unfortunately exception in everything. But let's look at the numbers. In Florida, I think as of today, four kids have that number four in uh, italy when uh, on april 18 we reached 20,000 deaths of those 20,000 deaths eight were in people under 39 year old in the same frame wow. time in, hey, wait, eight, eight were under 39 yes eight. wow wow only actually wait were eight under 39s for which there was no evidence that they had another condition Okay. If okay. you said you put together, if you added those who had previous diagnosis of cancer, who were for whatever reason in the ICU and got infected in the hospital, so they had other serious diseases. Now you had about forty-seven or forty-eight. Sure. Okay. But only it's still eight tiny. Of them. Yeah, that's still tiny. Yes. Yeah. But again, when you have a pre-existing condition, it's a very serious uh, disease for anybody, even if you are young. But if you do not have a pre-existing condition and you're young, the risk is relatively low. I mean, compare in Italy, for example, in four weekends in the month of June, 72 people died of uh, uh, motorcycle accidents. Uh, all of them are young kids. Mm -hmm. Still, we drive motorcycles. So compare that to the eight who died of COVID-19, you see the risk, okay? Yes, everything can happen to anybody. I mean, I'm sitting here, an airplane can crash and kill me. The chance, it's minimal, but it could happen. Right. So that's the reality that is important to present so that people can understand if they are at risk or not and what are the precautions that they need to take. Okay, great. So when we're looking at the overall case fatality rate, we have to also uh, factor in um, the difference between the symptomatic case fatality rate. So if you have symptoms, uh, if you have comorbidity, 
did you die from or did you die with coronavirus? These are issues that at the big level, when they when they publish these huge numbers, these are not really distinguished very well. Um, what do you propose? How do you propose that we what do you, you know, how should we change what we're doing in terms of tracking coronavirus? Uh, the, the, the statistics appear to be not very reliable either, and it's become entirely politicized uh, between the CDC and the, and the Trump administration, where yes, he's taking yeah. the tracking data away from CDC uh, and putting it into the HHS. So what, what, can, what, can, what can local hospitals do for their, you know, what can states do? What should they do, Mike, Michelle? What do you think? Look, <laughs> you ask many questions in one question. That's the, okay. The Take problem, your time. Ta unpack it. Take your time. The problem that you said is the main problem here, and that is that the disease has become a political issue, yeah. which should not be. This is a medical issue. Should right. not be a, an issue on whether you're Republican or Democrat. Should be what can we do to help people? And yeah. uh, what is the best attitude, the, the best measures that we can take? So that's the first thing. Uh, the numbers depend how you count, as you correctly say. I, I don't know if you know it, but Belgium is the country that has more deaths for COVID-19 than any other. And now why? I, I couldn't believe it, so I went and checked. Well, because they will count anything, anybody who dies, and who may have symptoms that may you think that the person had COVID as COVID, regardless of any testing. So that way, they want to error on the excess. And so, of course, if you count everybody who dies in this period was probably died of COVID, um, then uh, you have the numbers that you have. How do you count deaths? Well, how we have, as a pathologist, when I wrote, did an autopsy and I had to write the cause of death, you write the cause of death and the immediate cause of death in an in autopsy report. The cause of death, if you had a heart attack a week ago and you die a week later, is heart attack. But most likely that person went to the hospital, was put in the ICU, contracted bronchopneumonia and died of bronchopneumonia. That's what most people die, okay? Most people that die, die of bronchopneumonia. You go in the hospital, you, you are sick for other reasons, cancer, heart attack, eh? you contract bronchopneumonia and you die. Almost everybody who dies has bronchopneumonia, unless you die immediately. So you write that the cause of death was the heart attack or if the patient is a stage four lung cancer patient, the cause of death is lung cancer. The immediate cause of death is bronchopneumonia. When you talk about COVID-19, depends on how the patient is. If the patient was already terminally ill and then got infected with COVID-19, you should write that the cause of death was whatever was the cause that made him terminally ill, in the immediate cause of death was COVID-19. If the patient was relatively well before and got infected with COVID-19, ended up into the hospital and died, then the cause of death and the immediate cause of death is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So this is how we do in pathology autopsies and how we, do, we write autopsy reports. Depending on how you count, uh, then, of course, you can have different results. If you were to consider that those with underlying conditions died because of underlying conditions, then you artificially will lower the number of COVID-19 deaths. If all the people who get infected with COVID-19 died of COVID-19, regardless of the fact that they were already dying of something else, then you inflate the numbers with COVID-19 deaths. So, since different people, different states, different countries will use different methodologies, it's going to be impossible to have a, repro a reproducible thing, a more exact reproducing the, the numbers among different states. What comes across pretty clearly is that if you are a man, you have a two or three times higher risk of dying than if you are a woman. Mm -hmm. And that uh, with that, 
people over uh, 80 years old that ended up in the ICU, 40% of them die. But even when you say 40% of them die, that is not correct, because if you were a man, you would say 55% of them died, and if you were a woman, 25% of them died. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, those are large percentages, Michelle. Uh, you know, the um, fascinating thing is a biomarker guy having developed biomarkers for cancer in my past career for early de detection. It seems we know that the immune system of the people that are uh, at highest risk of mortality, in addition to the age uh, and comorbid conditions, seems to be a very pro-inflammatory immune system. Do you know about that uh, in terms of their outcomes? They have a TH2 skew, T helper yes, cell too. And in fact, the reactivity of the, the personal reaction to the infection uh, can cause that uh, cytokine storm that in patients with COVID-19 has been the cause of that in many of them. Now there is this new grab, uh, drug, Teluchuzumab, uh, that uh, um, is able to uh, interfere with the cytokine storm. And that's why uh, also the number of people that today die when they are uh, um, after, when they develop COVID-19, yeah. it's much lower than it was uh, a few months ago, because now we have uh, ways to prevent this uh, cytokine storm and so to decrease the numbers of that. So today, much less people are dying. And I hope that as new drugs get developed, for example, this monoclonal antibodies that several companies in the United States are developing, and they should become available soon. Um, mm -hmm. The hope is that they will drastically reduce the number of deaths. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know of any assay or prediction model that's used if a person has uh, presents with symptoms of dry cough and so on, and there looks like looks like they're trend, trending towards a diagnosis of COVID nineteen that that would actually be able to predict who's going to have a bad course versus a you know a better prognosis. I know uh, in cancer we've done this as well to look for biomarkers in the blood or serum to be able to predict, uh, you know, prognosis under different treatments. Have you heard of anyone doing that kind of research? Um, I have uh, read things about that. I read uh, an article that appeared, I think was on ja uh, either, I think was Lancet Oncology, I may be wrong, but that shows that uh, people who have a mutation of the TLR7, one of the toll receptors, are those who are more susceptible to the disease and who will die. Um, they, uh, the study looked at brothers young, who had died of the disease and who were young to try to understand why these people got it so bad in spite of their young age. And uh, um, these two couple of brothers, the study was done in Holland, both of them, they were unrelated, but to, both of these two couple of brothers had deletions in the toll receptor 7 receptor, which basically means that their in, uh, native immunity was altered, and so they were not able to mount an, an immune response adequate against mm -hmm. COVID-19. Um, I don't think that those tests can be done um, on a large scale because mm -hmm. um, unless you are a specialized place who does that test, um, that is not a test that is done on large scale. But that explains why some people get it so bad, because they cannot mount a, a proper immune response. Right. So uh, uh, I've seen, uh, you know, case, case studies that the, the TH2 appears to be out of balance with TH1. And I know those, those cellular assays, you have to have cytotoxic T cells to mount an, an initial good response. And what about cross-reactivity to other coronaviruses? Do you think that that's um, a part of the reason why a large part of the population appears to not be affected? I don't think so, because although it is possible, there is a, one of the um, uh, coronaviruses, there are four coronaviruses that cause uh, um, 20 or 30% of colds every year, and they don't kill anybody. 
Yeah. And there is one one of them they show that some antibodies against this coronavirus can diminish the infectivity of uh, SARS-CoV-2. But in, uh, another study uh, that was done on SARS proved that the antibodies against SARS did not protect against SARS-CoV-2. So that there was no much cross protection. The hope at the beginning was that those who had been infected with SARS, which is a small fraction at least, but they could be immune, but they are not apparently. Um, so they are not, they are, the, the cross reactivity appears possibly to exist more intense when you do those uh, serological tests, the antibody tests to see whether somebody has antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, that uh, there can be cross reactivity and so you can have a false positive results because the antibodies against something else. Sure. Um, and that has, of course, uh, created some problems with this uh, serological test. There was a paper that came out a few days ago showing that now the, the serological test that is largely used in the United States is directed against the nucleoprotein rather than the spike protein. And unfortunately, the antibodies against the nucleoproteins fade pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, the false negative results would be very high because you will not detect people who have been infected who can be immune because they have memory T cells and a T cell response ready to kill the virus. But right. if you are checking only the nucleoprotein antibody, you think that the person has not been infected, that the person is not immune, but that the person is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So there's a greater, greater more, more an, again, an exaggerated concern over susceptibility to having a. Um, not only just an infection, but I've also recently started to appreciate that if people have anything, uh, they have a, an initial strong immune response, or if they have uh, some immunity, some memory immunity, that they are going to have lower viremia. And although they may have an infection be asymptomatic, they're less likely to, to transmit the virus, I would think, right? That they have yeah. uh, smaller, smaller um, titers of, of, of virion in their in their blood um what about uh looking at comparing SARS-CoV-2 infection related fatality rates to in say nursing homes to the fatality rate of other viruses um you know if, if we're there's a study out that was done in 2003 that came to my attention it was sent to me when SARS was, uh, there was an outbreak, and there was this other, there was this other coronavirus. It was a common cold coronavirus, OC43, and it had an eight percent fatality rate in nursing homes, OC43. And the question, obviously, that I'm leading towards is, what you know, if we knew the fatality rate of, say, other causes of pneumonia, RSV synaptical virus or influenza for that matter in nursing homes and we stated those rates and we stated the would we be as concerned about those as we would SARS-CoV-2? What SARS-CoV-2 is uh, uh, good at unfortunately is to infect people so uh, um, when you look at viruses, on one end, you look at their ability to kill people. At the other hand, you look at their ability to infect people. Right. So the problem of this virus is that he can infect pretty well other people if you have them in enclosed space, of course, not if you are outside. Um, and that, uh, because the rate of infection is pretty high, that's why this virus has spread so much. The virus spreads best, as you know, when it doesn't kill too many people. If it kills everybody, or it kills a lot of people, like Ebola, then you will never have an epidemic because those who get infected die. A virus that kills some, but not too many, can spread around, and that's SARS-CoV-2. The nursing home had been a disaster, uh, and especially in Milano, in Italy, where the authorities took the unprecedented uh, measure to take the people who were sick and put, and put them in the nursing homes because the hospitals were full. Once they did that, they caused a, a disaster. They killed everybody. I mean, of course, they didn't know that what was happening. It was the beginning of the epidemic. But that's why Milano was so bad, because they took people and put them in the nursing homes. And that's where the most susceptible people are. Now we are far ahead in the epidemics. 
now we understand who are the people who are susceptible, that are the people in the nursing home, that are the old people, the people with other conditions. And those are the people that should be protected. Those are the people towards whom all the resources should be put so that they don't get in contact with the virus. For example, people who have COVID, uh, who are suspected or who have SARS-CoV-2 and should be tested, should not go to the hospital. The hospitals in Milano, in Wuhan, were the places where the epidemic spread. Yeah. Because these people were all coming to the hospital and they infected other people. Yeah. But as a result of that, you have today that in Italy and in the United States, and I suspect everywhere in the world, the diagnosis of cancer have decreased. Why? Because people are not getting checked. Because people are not going to the hospital. That will cause a very large number of deaths. The, the director of the NCI estimated at least 10,000 more deaths of cancer that could have been prevented if these people got regular checks as of today. But if the problem continues, the 10,000 will become many more because people are afraid to go to the hospital or because the hospitals have stopped doing colonoscopies because they only have they only treat people with COVID or they have to reserve the space for the COVID. Yeah. And then you have all this colon cancer that will present in a more advanced stage. So when you talk about this disease and what needs to be done to prevent people from dying of COVID, you do not you have also to balance the measures that you are taking with the damage that you may inadvertently cause because people no longer get those therapies, those treatments that save their lives. And that's where, for example, it's very important to have people suspected to be infected with SARS, not to go to hospitals, but to have local clinics where they get tested so that you can maintain the normal activity of the hospitals and so that people that go to the hospital don't have to be worried that they can be infected. But there has to be a balance here. Otherwise, if we only have this uh, fear about COVID, we do not realize the number of people who are going to die and who are dying because they have other conditions. Yeah, the same is true for many elective surgeries, which are not truly elective. They're actually life-saving electives. There's so, uh, as of May, I was just reading something, even far, as far back as May, there were a million healthcare um, employers, uh, employees that were out of job. They were put on furlough um, as the hospital shut down to try to prevent internal transmission. Um, the, the other costs that, that we know about now are the, the deaths of despair, the loss, the job loss, the suicide rate associated with uh, job loss and so on. Um, in California, there's now been more suicides than from COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Redfield from the CDC just announced today, I think, that there were more suicides um, in the United States from deaths of despair. So mm, are we, are we, you know, destroying too much, waiting for the holy grail, the vaccine? Or what do we, you know, we do we know enough about how to treat, in your opinion? And diagnosis is still a mess. I know that the, the PCR tests are not accurate, but look, um, it's uh, the common sense that is needed and the balance in in what we do. Uh, there is an article in uh, Global Lancet, I think it's called, that uh, estimated that in the next six months, 1.2 million kids and 55,000 mothers will die globally because of the restriction imposed because of COVID-19. And that is because kids will not receive vaccinations and because mothers will not receive proper gynecological obstetrician care at the time that the kids are born. Now, 1.2 million kids, 55,000 mothers deaths, that's a lot. That's too much. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I say it's important to maintain a balance in which we take care of the fraction of people, which is a critical fraction, and, but that's a fraction of the yeah. population that is at very high risk. And we, do, we put the resources there, but we do not disrupt the entire health care of this world, causing all this uh, uh, collateral damage, which is not collateral. I mean, it's, 
1.2 million deaths of kids becomes the main damage, not anymore right. ecological. That's right. Damage. That's right. That's right. And so that's where the balance need to be put, and that's why it's important to inform the public and not to create unnecessary hysteria and scare. For example, you still see that the most simple measure that you can take to the to avoid infections is to open a window to keep the door open. Sure, if I enter into a shop and there are other people, it's a good idea to keep the mask. But still, everywhere I go, they close the door behind me. Why don't they keep the door open? I mean, that is the basic simple thing. That's a great idea. Just leave the door open and let the air flow oh, clear. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But yeah, it's, it's surgical, it, in, in the surgical theater, there's air exchange. The temperature is low. When you use a surgical, when you use a medical mask in surgery, you actually wash your hands. They're very sterile. Use gloves, and you change your mask, but every fifteen to thirty days. So there's problems with people wearing the same mask all week. They don't wash it. There's problems there too. Yes, you see that they go to the restaurant. They put the mask on the table. <laughs> they don't have any they can. Then they put the mask back. I mean, come on. Right. But the basic thing that is open the window and open the doors because that's the way to get rid of the aerosol that is probably the most the, the main reason that people get infected you can go in any supermarket and you tell me which supermarket keep the door open but they will mm -hmm. check how many people are in the supermarket but still they keep the door closed open uh, closed mm -hmm. yeah that's true there's also uvc lamps that are not too expensive that could you know disinfect an entire massive supermarket right they could turn on the uvc lamps for 15 minutes every six hours or so yeah. yeah all right well listen um i would like to ask you specifically uh do you know of any just because you're so expert in cancer and research do you know of any specific relationship between uh coronaviruses and cancer other than the research that was done years ago and trying to use some of them uh you know, for treatment. But is there any particular risk of any types of cancer uh, following SARS-CoV-2? It looks like that those with hematologic malignancy may be at higher risk, and that's usually because their immune system is the most compromised. Mm -hmm. And of course, people who are taking immunosuppressive drugs are very susceptible to it. So not all cancer I have the same risk. If you have an, if you do not have an hematologic malignancy and you are not taking therapies that immune that are immunosuppressant, right. then probably the risk is not that high. Doesn't that flip flop if you actually are prone to have a cytokine storm and if you happen to be taking the right kind of immunomodulatory drug, it might help you, right? If, <laughs> if, right? It's uh, it's kind of ironic, right? It's a diabolical. It's kind of yeah. But it, it, isn't that true for almost everything in medicine and in this world? That's you true. Take the, that's you true. take the aspirin to get a heart attack and you get a brain hemorrhage, right? Yeah, that, that's that's absolutely true. So, um, you know, a, a lot of my followers and listeners, are, are they want to know personal. What do you do? What, how do you how do you carry yourself when you go out in public uh, to protect yourselves and others? Uh, are you concerned that there's going to be transmission or is it just not an issue in Hawaii? Look, in a way, the risk is minimal, but really mm -hmm. minimal, because we live outside. And that would be helpful to explain to the people in Hawaii. Um, the How I carry myself. When I walk outside, of course, I don't wear a mask. And, and uh, if I walk in a park, if I walk on the beach, if I, if I am sitting on the balcony of my house, if I'm out, there is no need to to wear a mask. The virus doesn't travel in the air. Uh, and the, the risk, it's so minimal that you can forget about it. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would not uh, stay in a crowd. That's not a good idea to stay in a crowd with a lot of people attached next to each other. But if you walk outside and you mind your own business, there is no need for a mask. And that would relax a lot of people if you just explain this simple thing. But when I enter into a shop where there are other people, of course I wear a mask. When I am in a place that there are other people and that the place is closed and there is AC, then yes, I use a mask. It's not that the AC caused the infection. It's that mm -hmm. 
the AC is in place so that the window can be closed. And there are many places where the window have to be closed because they were built that way. Now that means that the air recirculates. That means that if somebody was in that room two hours ago, the virus is still there. It's just going through the AC and coming around and around and around and around. So if you are in an enclosed space, definitely you should wear a mask. First of all, to protect other people. If you have it and you sneeze it or you cough, you will protect other people from being infected. And secondly, because the mask will also prevent you, but mostly you wear a mask to protect other people. If you are outside, there is no need to wear a mask. And uh, we know that from all the data that are out there, that the infections are almost always traceable at enclosed environments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yet, this very simple distinction is not often made. For example, we talk about what activities, what restaurant can be open, cannot be open. Well, a lot depends whether you have a restaurant that allows you to be on outside or to keep the windows open, or if you don't. And the risk is going to be very different. And that's what people should learn, not in a political way. It's right. not that I do wear a mask because I'm a Republican when I walk in the street and I become a Democrat because I wear a mask when I enter into a supermarket. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no sense, okay? Right. I'm not wearing a mask in the park because I don't need it. And right. I wear a mask in the supermarket because I need it. Okay. So uh, have you been tracking the vaccine development for COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2? Have been following okay. those studies? There are 137 in the process. Of those, uh, five are pretty advanced. Two are identical and are RNA vaccines that are made in the United States. Mm -hmm. Two are adenovaccines that are made in China. And one is a, a chimp adenovirus. The other are human adenovirus, the Chinese one. One is a chimp adenovirus that is made in England. And uh, um, all of them have reported more or less good initial results. Now they have to go in a phase three clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's important to understand that the initial tests were done in young people because you have to do them by law in people who are between 18 and 55. The people that we want to protect are not the 18, 55, are the 65 and older. Or at so that means that we still do not know whether the vaccines will be able to elicit the same immune response in people who are older and who may be less capable of mounting an immune response. But we hope that they will. And then hopefully one of these vaccines will actually work. Most of the experimental vaccines don't work. Um, in spite of the initial positive results, often an experimental vaccine ends up not working. So we hope that they, well, at least one of them will work. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that sometimes in uh, the spring, we should have uh, a vaccine available for mass vaccination. In the meantime, the main, the main hope is uh, these new drugs that pharma is producing, the immunoglobulins, the antibodies that I told you before, that would uh, uh, be used not only to treat people who are sick, but could also be used for people who are at very high risks. For example, medical doctors, nurses, who probably would be covered by an injections every couple of weeks or maybe every couple of months, because they would have a, a passive immunization with these antibodies so that they would not become sick. So I think that in the coming months you will see a decrease in mortality because new, more effective drugs are developed. You are not going to see a decrease of infections. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are 4 million infected people in the United States. That means that we found 4 million positives. That means there are probably 40 million infected, okay? Yep. The, the idea that we can control it, the idea that you can track uh, tracing these people, He's out of this world. That's right. I mean, like, you, you have to realize when you lost. And we can't track tracing 40 million people. It's impossible. There are not the resources to do this. That's correct. You could shut down the country for the next three months, and then you would take it under control. But economically speaking, in terms of the life that that would cost, it would probably be worse than not doing it.
So, What's your take on the hydroxychloroquine debacle? Well, the hydroxychloroquine was a disaster, a debacle in particular, because there was uh, apparently a company in Chicago who provided data that they could not substantiate. Mm -hmm. That caused uh, more unnecessary mess around it because what the public is going to think of two articles that are published, then they are retracted in two of the most respected journals that are New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet. Those articles should never have been published. Um, I don't understand why you, we publish uh, a paper if uh, you cannot check the data. I mean, it seems absurd to me, and I hope that we will change that. If somebody wants to publish something, they may they have to make the data available. I'm all for that. Those, sure. those, the, those papers were published when the, the owner of the data say, no, I'm not going to share the data. I mean, that's absurd. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that would happen. Unfortunately, that uh, has uh, uh, created even more mess. There was a study by the University of Minnesota that was published that is the only randomized uh, uh, clinical study on hydroxychloroquine that I know of. They treated the, uh, with hydroxychloroquine people who have been in contact with people with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the others were treated with the vitamins to see whether the um, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, decreased the incidence of infection in a pre and, and it didn't. There was absolutely no difference. So that study was negative and did not provide any evidence in support of the fact that hydroxychloroquine works. So, so far, that's the only study that I'm uh, aware of that was a phase three clinical trial done in a reputable uh, university in the United States. Do you know anything about the, um, the population that was studied? Uh, was it uh, late stage? Were they early stage? Uh, people with comorbidity or not? No, what they did uh, was uh, they treated uh, people who got in contact with people who were infected. So somebody who went in and they had this group that was at risk of being infected because yeah. they've been in, con in close contact to people who were infected. And so uh, some of them were given hydroxychloroquine and some of them were given vitamins. And they wanted to see if they would see a difference, and they did not see any difference. So it's amazing because vitamins are not inactive biological uh, entities. In fact, uh, there's a study out by David Brownstein in Michigan. He had 107 patients that he was treating with high dose vitamin A, D, vitamin C, uh, and other types of treatments. Um, he had zero deaths out of 107. He had one hospitalization on the core protocol. Now it's a case series study. The next step would be a randomized trial, but the level of evidence isn't there, but it's a case series study. But you would think that they would have used, uh, uh, you know, why did they choose? They would just, you'd think they would look at it at the mortality rate or serious illness rate or critical illness rate for people earlier in the outbreak who were, were not given vitamins or hydroxychloroquine. So I think we should look at those rates and see, right? Because there's no reason not to think that hydroxychloroquine wouldn't work. We understand some of its mechanisms of action, I think, in the cell, uh, you know, preventing the zinc from getting into the cell and things like that. But I think the question is still out. But thank you for your input on it. Um, now, are you familiar with the um, disease enhancement that was found in the vaccine trials for earlier coronaviruses, where they, uh, researchers would take ferrets or mice and they would um, use the experimental vaccine on the animals and then expose them to SARS or MERS and that there was a higher rate of mortality in the elderly mice, I think it was, and some of the ferrets study, um, if you had the vaccine and then it followed up with uh, an infection with the, with the wild type virus. Are you familiar with disease enhancement? Well, that is always a problem when you give a vaccine, and mm -hmm. that's always a concern. My understanding is that these vaccines that I discussed before, the two Chinese, the two American, and the English vaccine, have 
proven to be effective in animals. Actually, I should correct on the English vaccine, the, Ox the so-called Oxford vaccine. Sure. Because the Oxford vaccine um, prevented the chimp to become ill, but the virus was able to establish itself in the throat of the chimps. Right. So that would indicate that the vaccine can um, help, I mean, in, at least in a chimp, help the shim not to get sick, but that the shim can transmit the virus to other shims. Right. And that's not what you want with the vaccine. You want to create somebody who is immune and also some, and, and that means somebody who will not get sick, but we will not pass the disease. Right. So that remains to be seen what happens in humans. Yeah, so we saw that asymptomatic transmission development in pertussis. There was a baboon study where the baboons were given pertussis vaccination and they could still transmit pertussis to other unvaccinated um, baboons. But the disease enhancement process itself is a, is a special concern because the animal studies in the past actually helped bring up the vaccine studies to an, a, a stop, uh, to a halt, because it was clear that they shouldn't go forward because of the rates of mortality, serious illness in the mice. Um, but yet the Moderna, the, the Moderna vaccination, the NIID's uh, um, partner in this, and other studies on vaccines have skipped the animal studies in phase one, I suppose out of, you know, concern to try to, to get a vaccine as soon as possible. But they, they've had plenty of time now to either conduct the animal studies to look for disease enhancement through antibody dependent enhancement or, or what I call pathogenic priming or uh, um, publish the results that they, they may already have. So where do you think we stand? What's your like, you know, 10,000 foot view about what's the likelihood of seeing pathogenic priming, AKA disease enhancement uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines? What do you think? I think that that's why it's so, it's so important to wait for the outcome of these phase three clinical trials yeah. in which people will be given the vaccine, including those who are older than 55, and we see what happens. And only after the phase three clinical trial is concluded, and we are sure that the vaccine works the way that we want to work, then you pass to the public. I know that some people would want the vaccine tomorrow morning, but that's why you need to be careful in medicine because there can be unwanted effects. And a phase three clinical trial certainly will show that. What the phase three clinical trial may not show is how effective is the vaccine to protect you. Because of course, when you vaccinate these people, then you have to tell them not to wear masks, not to go to places where they can get infected. Mm -hmm. And so it may take time before you know it. Um, a few months, may not be enough to give you the answer whether you're sure that the vaccine worked. Now, I heard and I read somewhere that researchers are planning to, to get the vaccine and inject themselves with the virus and see whether they get infected or not. Um, that is a, a, a touchy topic, of course. I it think is. That so is you, the, the vaccine studies used to be done that way. I found some from the 1950s in coronavirus or the uh, 1960s, where they took human subjects and they gave them a vaccine. And then nine, six, uh, three, six, six and nine months later, they, you know, exposed them to the virus. Uh, this is the nature of the animal studies to expose the animals. My point is we have plenty of time now before the end of the phase three, we can conduct the animal studies 10 times over. Don't you think we should conduct these animal studies to bring the data forward so we know what we're looking at? In part because, you know, I've gone under the hood of vaccine safety studies and they separate adverse events into those that are solicited, that are known or suspected to be attributable to the vaccine, and those that are unsolicited. And out of the unsolicited adverse events, Michelle, they then have a panel of doctors who decide on a case-by-case -case basis that, yes, this one was likely to be caused by the vaccine or this one wasn't. And it, it doesn't, it's not the same as an animal study where it's pretty clear you have such strict experimental control that you have a nice large control group, you have a nice large experimental group, any difference is causally attributed in an experiment, whereas in a you know randomized clinical trial, 
it seems to be more you know open to debate was it really happened did it really attribute to the vaccine or not so shouldn't we conduct animal studies now i mean we have plenty of time right if uh, the animal studies have not been conducted and that we are conducting a phase three clinical trial in humans in parallel it would be certainly a good idea to do the animal studies so that if something in particular comes out in the animal then you can focus on that in the human and see if something similar has happened in the human yeah. so definitely if the animal studies have not been done it would be a good idea in parallel to do animal studies to be sure that everything is safe before we give to hundreds of millions this vaccine but when you go to the hundreds of millions the, the, uh, the issue is going to be to produce this virus to have hundreds of million doses. You mean and the vaccine, yeah. Mm-hmm. The vaccine, and sorry. And to That's have, okay. See, I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then to have uh, the way to deliver it, because I was uh, um, discussing this issue with uh, the guy who is in charge of vaccine distribution in a big pharmaceutical company. And he told me that... Uh, uh, 80% of all the material, all the glass vials, come from China. And so that uh, unless we get the Chinese to give us the glass vial, he wouldn't know how to make, where to pack the virus. And the same thing is true from the needles. So it will be very important that we get over these uh, um, issues that we have and that we all work together to make a vaccine, whether it is the Chinese vaccine or the American vaccine, but that we all work together to make a rule. Okay, so there must be a plan B that we can envision, right? So let's say the vaccine comes out during phase three, clinical, those are two, three, two slash three phase clinical trials, they combine them. But, but let's say that there is some uh, very large proportion of people who are all healthy, all these people are healthy volunteers, right? They're, and, and, and we see that there's some something like disease enhancement or some unforeseen high rate of adverse events. What do we do then? What if there is no vaccine, right? That's a nightmare scenario. What does society do then? What's our best I response, hope, Michelle? I hope that if the vaccine do not work, which is a possibility, I mean, we do not know that any of them will work. Karen, right, Remember? absolutely, sure. I mean, I will never forget asking Bob Gallo in 1986, when I was a young kid, the Dr. Gallo, how long is it going to take to have a vaccine for HIV? And he told me next year, and I said, what if things go bad? Five years. We are in 2020 and we don't have a vaccine for HIV. Exactly, okay? exactly. So don't you, let's not give for a, as a done deal something that is not a done deal. We hope right. that we will. If in the event that this do not work, I very much think, in this case, I'm pretty optimistic, that the uh, medicines that that uh, pharma is developing, in particular these uh, immunoglobulins, antibodies, that can be given to people, mm-hmm. and other drugs that have already come, like Tetrazumab and Mesivir and others, will be able to reduce the mortality of this disease to terms that we can live with. And uh, so maybe we will have to treat the disease rather than trying to get rid of it, if uh, that's the case. Okay, so right now I think my, by my calculations and other calculations, including CDC, the case fatality rate, including all the considerations of all the caveats that we spoke about, is something like 0.26% for a coronavirus, with SARS-2 coronavirus. 0.26% of people that have let's say, call it coronavirus or suspected coronavirus, because they don't, all don't get tested. But that 0.26%, um, that's about double that than influenza. So I think what you're saying, Michelle, and I would tend to agree, that if we can get pharmaceuticals of any t- type or other treatments that can bring down the case fatality rate significantly to the point where it's a, like a bad flu season, then we have a precedent for society being able to tolerate uh, fairly large numbers of reported deaths attributed to flu. Um, although the CDC makes it difficult, uh, they, they would say 55,000 about per year from influenza in terms of death, but they combine an influenza they actually call it influenza syndrome or influenza disease 
um, when in reality they combine the deaths from RSV, uh, SV, influenza, and ironically, coronavirus. So back in 2014, the number of deaths due that were attributed by testing to influenza confirmed to influenza virus was something like 5,000. And by combining them, that's where we get to 55,000. I've done a deep dive analysis on their reporting. So if we get somewhere down around 55,000 deaths per year, do you think then we can um, say, okay, well, this is a tolerable, unfortunate, very sad, but tolerable uh, population wide risk? And knowing, of course, we need special protections in nursing homes. And, and, and right, we, th this is the problem. The risk is clustered. It's geographically clustered. It's um, demographically clustered. And so we understand those risk factors. The risk to most people is practically nothing. The question then becomes, okay, if, if there's no vaccine that's viable, then how do we protect those who are vulnerable? And I think that's the legacy of coronavirus, that we've learned that we care about people that are not in our same demographic. We care about people that are different age groups enough to shut down society for coronavirus. Clearly, approach our approaches to infectious disease will be very different in the future, don't you think? I think so. And there are uh, some practical things, some simple things that can be done. Some are more difficult, but some are, are relatively simple. Um, when you, the averages are difficult, are, do not represent the disease, because when you have a 0.5% or 0.25, as you said, or 1% overall mortality, in reality, you have even lower mortality if you talk about children between 0 and 20 year old. Right. And, and you have, however, a very serious mortality of 40% when you're talking about people who are over 80 years old. And if you're talking about male in that age group, you go to, to 55%. Right. So it depends, as you say, the clusters and depends in which age group you are and what other conditions you have. But for example, now the summer is coming, right? Um, we are telling people who are in that age group to stay home. Because, of course, if you are an 80-year-old person, it's much more dangerous for you to walk out in a shop than it is for someone who is younger. Yeah. Well, the minimum that we could do for those people is to be sure, especially for those people who are not well off in the United States, mm -hmm. that they have an AC unit in their room. Because how are you going to keep a, a, these people in the houses if they do not have AC units that allows them to survive Yes. in places where it's extremely hot. And they may die of a heat stroke. You remember Absolutely. how many people died of heat stroke some years ago. Those are simple things that can be done to help people who need to be helped, especially people who are poor and who can afford that. Absolutely. And that, those, uh, uh, the, the UVC lamps, I, I purchased one. It ironically came from China. They're about this tall. They plug into any outlet. It, it gives you enough time to run out of the room so you don't give yourself skin cancer and it runs for 15 or 30 minutes and it disinfects everything in the room. So th I think we are learning that we have different options now. And uh, I, I agree with you and I really appreciate speaking with you about it. This interview, I think, will calm a lot of people down about the perspective of what's happening in the future. If there is a surge in cases, understand this is the reason why we have medicine. Can you? I can't imagine people in cancer saying that in cancer treatment saying we cannot we have to shut down because there's too many people coming at us in, in cancer we don't you know the medicine has a responsibility to society which is to respond to this and they've they've been shut down for a long time and if there is another surge now that we've learned better protocols uh you know medicine hopefully will rebound uh, in a robust manner enough to be able to help out i i very concerned that there's some that we're almost addicted to this lockdown strategy because it seems so convenient, right? That society would lock if we lock down, we don't cause a problem, then we don't have to deal with a problem. We're just delaying the inevitable, aren't we? Um, you know, I, I, it's possible. Look, the lockdown worked well when it was instituted early in the epidemic. And it worked in China because it was instituted at the level that we could never do in the United States or in the Western world. They literally locked people in the house and sealed the rooms with nails. 
yeah. to the lead. Okay, yeah. can't do that in the United States. Can't do that in Europe. It worked well in Italy because they sealed off Lombardia, the, the region where Milano is, and they locked them in and they didn't let them out. The whole region, and, yeah. And, and that worked. Uh, once, however, you talk about a large country like the United States, where now there are millions and millions infected, you are past the point in which you can lock down people and trace count them. Yeah. You may want to do that because you feel that you are doing something about it. Mm -hmm. But it's impossible to think that you are going to be effective in doing that because it's too much and too many. That's so right. you have to deal with it. You have to handle it in the best way you can with the resources we have that should be given to those who are most vulnerable, most susceptible to it. Unfortunately, new drugs are being developed and will be available and the mortality of this disease will decrease significantly. And then with a little bit of luck, we will have a vaccine and this thing will be over. Well, those are words from a wise person. I am sorry I'm off screen. I'm bringing up your uh, your editorial so that we can share it and uh, get some people to read it. And I'll put the link in the discussion as well. So let me just flash it on the screen here. Coronavirus facts, myths, and legend and, and hypothesis with the legendary uh, Dr. Michelle Carbone and colleagues. Um, so, um, well, in closing, is there any last message that you'd like to have? We're going to try to reach as many people as we can with this. The only thing that I can think of is that it's in anything, good sense, common sense is what is most important. Not exaggerate in one way and don't, not exaggerate in the other way. Try to leave the politics out of it. This is a disease. It's not a Republican or a Democratic issue, it's a disease. Yeah. We need to deal with it as best as we can, and uh, uh, we will be fine, and we need to do everything we can to help those who need to, to be helped. But scaring everybody is not helpful, is counter-effective, and uh, um, various governors around the United States hopefully will get the good advice for people who know about it, so that they can calm down the society that is the first step towards addressing this fine. I mean, as you know, in any circumstance that you can think of, if you panic, the outcome is never good. So remain I, calm. I, I agree. I agree. It takes a level head in any situation to be a survivor. And if we're going to survive this, which we will, people need to understand there will be a post-COVID period one way or the other. Um, yes. Well, listen, Michelle, thank you, Dr. Michelle Carbone. Thank you so much for being on Unbreaking Science. Um, we'll be in touch. We'd love to have you back again, maybe in six months and see where we're at and see who's, uh, how the scorecard is and who's making mistakes and who's getting it right. Would you like to come back? Sure, Jack. Thank you very much. Right on. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Unbreaking Science. Find us at unbreakingscience.com. And we're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. And 